Hey everybody, Charles for HumbleMechanic.com. Today I'm going to be taking your questions on VR6s, tattoos, ASEs, and more. This is episode 59 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. Alright, so in order to get a question on a show like this, send me an email to charles at humblemechanic.com and be sure to put question for Charles in the subject. That's how I filter out all the emails and pull the questions out. Before we get into the show, I just want to let you guys know I had a 2015 Golf Sport Wagon for a couple of days and I shot about seven different videos. Some as simple as how to sync your phone on Bluetooth as well as how to change a tire and where and how to check the fuses in the 2015 Sport Wagon. I'll put a link in the show notes. I made a whole playlist just for the Golf Sport Wagon, so you can check that out on YouTube. All right, let's get into your questions. First one comes from Scott. I need some advice. I'm considering buying a 2001 Mark IV GTI with the VR6. What's your opinion on this engine with it being my first car? It also has installed a supercharged Stage 2 Vortex kit is there anything I should watch out while buying a car like this with this particular engine? Is it reliable? All right, Scott, before we talk about the whole package, let's pretend this vehicle did not have a supercharger kit on it. So the biggest thing on the VR6s at that age is probably gonna be timing chains. You're gonna wanna make sure that the chains have been replaced or at least addressed in some way, depending on mileage especially. Now, if this car had 35,000 miles, it might not be as big of an issue. But my guess is on a car that's 14, almost 15 years old, it probably has considerably more miles than that. So you're really gonna wanna make sure that the chains have been replaced. The other thing that's actually really common on that engine is the runner inside the intake manifold failing. If you crack the throttle really quick from idle to say 2,000, 2,500 RPM, if the runner has failed, you'll actually hear it rattling inside the intake manifold. For the most part, you can get away with just replacing that runner and not the whole intake, but I have seen them wear so bad where you need to replace the entire intake manifold. In addition to those things, there's a bunch of other things you're going to want to look at. You're going to want to look at suspension components, you're going to want to look at brakes, you're going to want to look at belts, hoses, you're going to want to make sure the cooling fans work, you're going to want to make sure that the transmission shifts properly, you're going to want to make sure there's very little to no rust depending on the area that you live in, tires, you want to look at the vehicle as a whole package. If you're not sure on how to check all these things out, I really recommend spending the hundred bucks or whatever a dealership or a Volkswagen specialty shop will charge and take it in and get what's called a pre-purchase inspection and they'll look over the entire car and let you know about any issues that they find. All in all, that VR6 is actually pretty reliable. It's a similar engine to what I have in the Cabrio, but the intake manifold's different and some of the bolt-ons are a little bit different as well. Now, let's put that supercharger on and talk about that. The instant you start modifying a vehicle, the reliability tends to drop. Also, maintenance becomes even more important than it is normally. Now, I don't have a ton of experience with this supercharger kit specifically, but I can tell you you're going to want to make extra sure that the belt is good, you're going to want to make sure there's no noise from the supercharger, and you're going to want to make sure that there's no maintenance like an oil change on the supercharger that needs to occur. So whenever I hear that a vehicle's been modified, my red flag goes up and I actually take an even closer look at the vehicle than I would if it was plain stock. I want to know who did the work, I want to know what other mods have been done, Odds are if we're running a supercharger, we probably have some kind of suspension upgrades, maybe brake upgrades. I don't really know without seeing the car, it's hard to tell, but you want to take into account the entire vehicle and all the mods that have been made. I probably want to see receipts for a lot of these things. Now that may not be fair because if I bought mods for a car, I wouldn't have any receipts for where I had the work done, but I'm a Volkswagen tech, so it might be a little bit different. I would definitely want to know where this work was done. And again, if you're not 100% sure on what you're looking at, I always, always, always recommend taking it to either the dealer or again, a Volkswagen specialty shop and getting a pre-purchase inspection. And hey, Scott, if you buy this VR6, post a picture on the Facebook page, facebook.com slash humble mechanic, and, uh, and let us check it out. I'd love to see the supercharger. All right, next up. I realize that a way of expressing enthusiasm for something is to tattoo oneself so on that topic, do I have any idea on interesting mechanic tattoos? Do I feel like sharing details about my ink? I offer my humble apologies. If it is too personal, I'm not stalking, just interested in tattoos. Scott, this is a different Scott than the last question. Um, Scott, I personally don't have any like direct mechanic tattoos. Um, I do have some gear work on my chest. I think it's this side. 
Um, that's pretty cool. It's not something I share with, uh, with a ton of people, you know, I don't run around with my shirt off. I think mechanic tattoos can be really, really awesome. The problem is, and this doesn't come with the design or the idea behind it, it's the execution of it. Most of them that I've seen are ridiculously poor quality. Um, you know, it's like anything, you get what you pay for. Buying a cheap tattoo, you're gonna get a cheap, ugly tattoo most of the time. Tattoos are one area that I never recommend anybody cheaping out on. Spend the money. If you can't afford to get a good tattoo, you can't afford a tattoo to begin with. So things that I think are really cool are gear sets, um, internal engine parts, things that are very mechanical and industrial looking and feeling. That's the kind of stuff I like. You know, I've seen a lot of guys with snap-on tattoos on their forearms and whatever. You know, it's your body. I'm not really one to judge. Personally, I don't care. You can tattoo whatever the hell you want on yourself. But the quality of the tattoo is definitely, definitely, definitely very important to me. So um, if you're thinking about a mechanic tattoo or any tattoo, really, I always recommend making an appointment with a really good tattoo artist. Talk with them about what you're looking for. Bounce ideas ideas off of them. The girl that does my tattoo is an incredible artist and her and I will have usually a 20 minute conversation about what I'm thinking about and then she'll do something a thousand times cooler that I would have never even thought about. So I always recommend getting that consultation. A lot of times you have to pay for it, but usually if you get the tattoo, they include it in the price or whatever. But if not, trust me, it is worth paying the extra money for a really good high quality tattoo artist to do your work. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're going to wind up with some pretty nasty tattoo. And I'm sure we've all seen some of those. So uh, spend the time, spend the money, you know, draw it out, get the consultation with a tattoo artist, change it a million times if you have to, because, you know, once it's on there, it's on there. So great question, Scott. Next up comes from Daryl. We recently purchased a 2012 Passat for my wife, SE 2.5 Automatic. I believe VW wants the fluid changed around 50,000 miles or less on the transmission. We acquired the car used with 65K and are currently at 70,000 miles. Since it's new to us and we want it to last, is it safe to have the dealer change the transmission fluid slash filter, etc.? I know with old cars, they used to say, if you never change the fluid, just leave it or problems will start. Um, good question. At 70, you know, it... <laughs> You're right in the middle. It's due at 50, it's due at 100, you're right in the center. You could really go either way. Being 20,000 miles past due for the transmission service is not a big deal as far as changing the fluid and then having problems afterwards. I, for a long time, really did believe that once you hit a certain mileage, don't touch the fluid. Um, there's transmission experts, you know, from like ZF that say it doesn't matter. I'm not going to say do it or don't do it because sure enough, if I say one thing and you have a problem, you know, it's, it's going to look like that's my fault and I'm not prepared to put myself in that position. Um, you know, if this were my car, I'd probably go ahead and change it or go ahead and have it changed at the dealership. Um, you know, you're going to keep the car. You want it to last a long time. Now you know exactly when the fluid was changed. You know it was done at 70 and uh, you can just catch back up, do it at 120. It doesn't matter now that you're gonna be off mileage. Just make sure you get it done every 50,000 miles going forward and rock and roll and drive your car and love every minute of it. All right, next up comes from Mike. Hey, I'm a big fan. I've been in the aftermarket for almost 10 years now and I'm wearing thin on the low pay and older cars. I can imagine how that gets really old, by the way. Uh, what advice do I have for a technician who's trying to move from aftermarket slash tire shop to a European dealership? I also have seven ASE certifications, including advanced engine performance, and I was wondering if those would mean anything in the dealership. Your input is greatly appreciated. Thanks, Mike. Okay, Mike. Yes, ASEs do mean something in the dealership, but they also don't mean anything in the dealership. What the heck do I mean? Well, if I'm interviewing a candidate that has seven ASEs coming into my dealership, I already know, okay, this guy at least cares a little bit about his career and doing the work to get these certifications. I like the effort that it shows. I like that it shows you care about things. I like that it shows you want to be in good standings, you know, with the automotive community. And you put in the work to get there. So yes, it absolutely does mean something. Now, once you're in the dealership and working towards that brand certification, they may not really mean anything. Volkswagen, for example, you have to have a bank of instructor-led classes in order to achieve master certified. But before you can get that final last step of master certification, you either have to pass five Volkswagen specific tests 
or have all of your ASE tests, all, all nine or 10 or whatever there are now. So in that instance, you're already ASE wise, very close to being able to get that master certification. You have a hundred million classes to make up, but you don't have to worry about taking those five Volkswagen specific tests. Now, a lot of places will actually pay you more because you have ASEs. So that's another check in the box of, yeah, it's good to have ASEs. You know, when I first started at the dealership, my goal, I wanted to get all my ASEs and have a master ASE certified. But as I spent more time in the dealership, I realized that a lot of what ASE tests wasn't really specific to the things that I did every day. So there's very few specific Volkswagen questions on an ASE test. Well, I don't really care what vacuum controlled transmissions do. I don't work on them, I don't need to know anything about them. Now, if I know about them, that's great, but day to day, it doesn't really mean anything in my job. On the other hand, I need to know about the newest six-speed automatic transmission that Volkswagen has out, or the DSG, or the manual gearbox, or the Halidex unit. That's the stuff that I need to know. So those are the things that I'm gonna focus on. Now, a lot about ASE is very common knowledge in the automotive industry, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem for you to pass the test. But at the point of you having a dealership job, it's really up to you, and it's up to the dealership that you work for. Dealership A may say, yes, we require you to have all ASE certifications in order to reach a certain level of pay. Dealership B may say, I don't care what you do about ASC certifications. I wanna make sure you have factory certifications. If you want ASC, I'll pay for them, but it doesn't mean a lick of anything. So it really depends on the dealership that you do interview or get a job with on whether or not the ASCs matter or don't. So other than ASC, you know, you've been in the industry 10 years. Hopefully you have some experience on European cars. I would pick the brand that you like Go into the interview, know every model, know what engines they have, know something or as much as you possibly can about the brand and about the product that you can going into the interview because it's gonna make it look really good that you know at least something and I don't have to show you what the difference between a Jetta and a Passat is on your first day. So best of luck to you, Mike, and I really hope it works out for you. Next up comes from Steven. So I was wondering with Audi being part of the Volkswagen group and everything, does Audi operate a lot like VW? Of course brands will have little differences, but I know Audi and VW have a lot in common. I'm an aspiring tech and will be finishing high school in December. All right, awesome, awesome question. There's a ton, a ton of similarities between VW and Audi and Bentley and Porsche and the whole product line. A few Bentleys that I worked on had a ton of Volkswagen Audi part numbers that were the same. For example, I worked on a Bentley, I don't know, Continental or something, and it had the same clock spring part number as a Torag and a Phaeton. As I'm taking the steering wheel off and taking, you know, the steering column trim off, everything's exactly like a Phaeton is. So they're very, very similar. Where things get a bit different is in the architecture of the computer system. Volkswagen may control a component one way, Audi may do it another. Volkswagen may control a part through a convenience module, Audi may have a separate module for that part altogether. It really just depends on the generation that you're looking at. The newer the cars get, I think the further apart in architecture computer-wise they actually do get. Some of the older ones were very, very similar. Um, you know, they're built different. Uh, a rear window repair might be different on a Passat versus an A4 or, uh, you know, the TDI and the A3. Doing an oil change might be a little bit different than on a Jetta sport wagon, say. It really all depends on exactly what you're talking about. But I think for the most part, if you're a Volkswagen tech and you want to fix Audis, it's not a big deal. If you're an Audi tech and you want to fix Volkswagens, it's not a big deal. They're close enough that you'll wind up figuring out how to do whatever you need to do. It's pretty much, from my experience, mostly a matter of computer stuff. So great question, young man. I hope that you have a very, very successful career in the automotive industry. All right, next up from Scott, which is now the third Scott that we had questions from today. I've already answered a ton of questions concerning his 2011 Tiguan. I recently came across a series of folks complaining about the timing chain tensioner going on their 2.0 TSI engines. Some were pre-2012 Tiguans, some were GTIs. $7,000 to fix. Most were after 60,000 miles and out of warranty, but a few happened as early as 10K, although that was certainly not the norm. I'm approaching 45,000 on my Tiguan and hardly had any issues with it other than replacing coil packs and plugs at 39,000 miles. Should I be considering a preemptive replacement of the questionable timing chain tensioner with the upgraded part? 
or are those abnormal failures? Thanks again for all you're doing for the VW community, Scott. So, the timing chain tensioner on a 2.0 TSI does fail. I have seen several of them. I'm not sure it's at the exponential rate that the internet makes it out to be, but it may be. You know, things happen differently in different areas. This is just my experience and what I've ran into at the dealership. It does happen. I have seen it happen on cars that were perfectly maintained. I've seen it happen on cars that were terribly maintained. Um, so it really, you know, it, it could just be an abnormal failure on one and a totally neglectful thing failure on another car. But the question is, should you preemptively replace it? Well, no matter what the cost of replacing that tensioner is, it's not $7,000 worth of repairs. So if you make this preemptive repair, kind of like preventative maintenance, you're definitely gonna come out cheaper than if you had to replace you know, the cylinder head maybe, maybe the engine, it really depends on how catastrophic the failure of the timing chain tensioner really was. What's involved with replacing this tensioner is obviously replacing the tensioner part-wise. Um, I always recommend that customers replace that lower timing cover. They're on there really well with Volkswagen sealant, and most of the time you wind up tweaking or bending the cover just enough to make it leak when you're done with the repair. Also, upper timing chain cover leaks aren't terribly uncommon either. So if I were gonna be doing this job, I would wanna replace all the timing covers on the front side of the engine. Now, off the top of my head, I don't really remember what the labor or the parts cost is. Again, it's gonna be cheaper than $7,000. So, Scott, here's what I would do. I would call my local dealership and I would ask them, how much do you charge to replace that timing chain tensioner, including the lower cover and the upper cover gaskets? And you'll probably need some odds and ends, bolts, oil, um, sealant as well to do the job. And I would gauge it from there. If it's 400 bucks, you're darn right, I would replace it. If it's 2,000, ugh, I would probably not replace it right now. Um, you know, when you get into the $1,000 price range, that's a huge, huge, huge amount of money to spend on something that you don't know whether it's gonna fail or not. But I would rather spend $1,000 today and not really have to worry about that six to $7,000 repair down the road. So it's really, really a tough call to say, yes, absolutely, if you don't replace it, you're gonna have a problem no matter what or don't worry about it, you're never gonna have an issue, that was just a weird fluke of, of timing chain tensioners that failed. You know, one of the bad things about timing chains is they don't have any kind of service interval, so you really have to gauge whether replacing them as preventative is better than just not doing anything. Most of them last the lifetime of the car, but you really have to look at what's considered the lifetime of the car. Is it the lifetime of the car where I own it? Is it the lifetime of the car from the day it's built to the day it gets crushed? Is it the lifetime of the car from the day it gets built until that timing chain tensioner fails and now the car is you know, worth three grand in great shape but has $7,000 worth of work that needs to be done? So Scott, it's a tough call. It's a decision you're gonna have to make. I wouldn't really hate on anybody for doing it to ensure the prolonged life of their car. But again, in most cases, this is not a $200 repair. Now, if you're gonna do this repair yourself, it's actually not a terrible job, but there's one tool that you absolutely have to have. There's a tiny spacer that when you take the crank pulley bolt out and then take the crank pulley off, the spacer replaces the pulley. If you don't put this spacer in, you're gonna wind up putting your engine together out of time. I almost guarantee it. I've seen it happen several times at the dealership. Make sure if you're gonna do this repair yourself, you have all the special tools, as well as plenty of extra time and a little bit of mechanical skill to do the job. But great question, and uh, hey, let me know what you decide to do. I'm very interested in it. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comments section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at HumbleMechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, HumbleMechanic.com, and obviously on YouTube. Hey, again, if you've got a question you'd like to submit for a show like this, email me, charles at HumbleMechanic.com, and put question for Charles in the subject. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Today we're drinking Pinner from Oscar Blues in Brevard, North Carolina.